This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode number 369, Recorded on December 23rd, 2015. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks. (laughs) It's 59 Fahrenheit, 15 Celsius, cloudy sky. I'm trying to get more statistics for you, but it's taking me a while. It's really here. It's 10 degrees Celsius. It is cloudy, raining. I can't even see the other side of the Hudson River out my window. It is so foggy. It, it, was, it was cold for a couple of days. Now it's getting warm again. And the, the funny thing was, this morning I got up at 4 a.m. I looked out the window. It was absolutely clear. And then two hours later, it was foggy because it had warmed up so quickly. Really yeah. weird weather for the end of December. Yeah. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, extremely foggy here, too. Yeah. It's uh, like a half-mile visibility. I think it's opened out to a half-mile visibility. It was it was less than that when I drove my daughter to school this morning. So I have this weather app, which can show me a weather map. And it has Springfield. How about that? Ah, I guess cool. it's a major city, right? Yes, it's it, it was the first Springfield in the U.S., Mm. Huh. First of many, many, many Springfields. But according, it's, according to my map... Uh, it's also the largest Springfield. Um, you don't have any rain at the moment, is that correct? Uh, no, just fog. Yeah, it's with a green... But this is a big uh, weather system on the eastern seaboard. Yeah, going yeah I think from, we have this, uh, this front is just parked here, and it's all this warm, wet weather just sitting here. And there's something around Chicago, too, as well. Anyway, we don't care about that. Uh, <laughs> no, we do, but we don't have to talk about it. All right, this is another weird day. It's a Wednesday. It is noon. Our sheng, feng shui, right? Feng shui. Feng shui. Feng shui is all messed up, but we'll get through it. I don't know how many people will actually listen because uh, listening and reading of all this stuff goes down in these last two weeks of the year, but we will do it because we have a good time, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And there's so much science to talk about, in particular virology, that we want to do it. Mm-hmm. This episode of TWIV is brought to you by the 32nd Clinical Virology Symposium. You can now send in your abstract for this meeting, which is taking place in Daytona Beach, Florida, May 19th through the 22nd. You have until March 17th to submit your abstract, and you can... Then present your research on rapid viral diagnosis, the clinical course of viral infections, and preventive and therapeutic approaches for virus infections in front of over a 1,000 esteemed researchers and primary care physicians. I did change a word in this advertisement Mm. because I didn't like, what did they take out? Modalities. Modalities. Also, mm-hmm. also, you're going to debut your latest research on rapid viral diagnosis, is the way they put it. Mm-hmm. I um, I looked up modality, and it just didn't fit. Didn't no. fit at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I wrote in my, the notes here. My theory was that they ran it through Google Translate from English to English. <laughs> <laughs> that would do it. And, right? and got all these alternative words that made it sound fancy, but didn't really quite convey the meaning. It's a good explanation. Anyway, if you would like to register for this meeting, you can go to asm.org slash cvs2016, and uh, that is the American Society for Microbiology who is running this meeting. 2016, we're almost there. Wow, the last days of 2015. I I thought at the beginning of this year I would not enjoy an odd-numbered year, but it was okay. Oh, do you usually not enjoy odd-numbered years? I have to tell you, all my thermostats are set to even numbers. <laughs> and my wife knows that, well, when when I see one set to an odd number, it's because she's changed it to bug me. <laughs> so, for example, in my car, you know, it's te- it's set on 20 degrees Celsius. 
and she'll put it on 21 or 23. My my thermostat at home, I usually have it at 68. She'll put it at 69 or 71. <laughs> you know, I, I really don't care, but for some reason I like it on an even number, and um, it's a silly thing. I not- you should say that because <laughs> I have this thing about odd-numbered years and odd-numbered ages. Mm. So I feel better when I'm an even-numbered age. Yeah. Let's see. This is 2015. So I am 62 this year. I'm going to be 63. Yeah. Uh-oh. So yeah. it was maybe a tough year. Who knows? So see, so for you, it's always opposite. You're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm mostly mostly odd age in an odd year. So, And I have more data on the weather now. I found the app that has it. Um, mostly I wanted it because it has sunrise, 8.01 a.m., sunset, 5.06 p.m. So already we're wow. getting later sunsets. Remember last week it was five oh four. Yeah, I think our sunset is four thirty something. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that's because we passed the twenty first already. Yes, right? yes, we just passed the solstice. Ah, very new. I just love longer days. Yeah, I yes. do not like getting up in the dark and I leave this the lab and it's dark. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> is there any place in the world where it would be light all year round in the morning and in the evening? Well, you could do like the, um, I think it's the Arctic turn that <laughs> migrates from the North Pole to the South Pole, from the Arctic to the Antarctic every year. All so, right, so there's ah. no place where you can... There's no light. place where you would get 24-hour daylight um, 12 months out of the year. Well, it doesn't have to be 24 hours, but just when I go just to work days. and when I come home. I guess the equator would probably give you the best. Yeah. Deal. And and you, well, it might depend how your time zone is set, though, and when you... Oh, yes. You know, go and come right. from work, too. Yeah, yeah. And so then I was thinking China, because they have one time zone for the whole country. Oh. So it might, I don't know how. Anyway, you'll have to work on that, Vincent. <laughs> I'll just deal with it. You know, that's the other thing. All right, we have a bunch of follow-ups, follows up. First one is from Rich Condit, who writes, Twiveroonies. That's a new one, right? Yeah. It is the morning after recording Twiv 368. <clears throat> In Sun River, it is 30 Fahrenheit minus 1 Celsius overcast with some sun expected and thankfully very little additional precipitation in the forecast. I just finished listening to TWIV 367, Two Sides to a Coin, the episode where my audio spazzed out. I had not finished listening to it in advance of 368 in in the quiet of this forest home, anticipating an invasion of family for the holidays. Listening to your, our conversation, I got all warm and fuzzy about what a privilege it is to be able to share this experience with you every week. Thanks to all of you, especially Vincent, for maintaining this activity and being part of my life. Sniff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Aww. It's, a, it's a lot of fun for us, too. Yes. I enjoy it. I have two delayed, maybe I can pull rank here, follows up, including a pick that maybe could be aired on Christmas or New Year's or when I return, hopefully, for 371. First, though I heard most of the CAS-4 nuclear capsid discussion, I was too distracted with audio issues to put my two cents in. Rather than do it here, I would like to claim a brief spot upon my return to revisit the issue of what is a nuclear capsid. This is an area of interest to me, and it is not entirely black and white, I don't think. Um, or I'll, I'll, I'll wait. By the way, Vincent said the approach was entirely bioinformatics, Eugene Kunin would bristle. It is computational biology. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Second, the discussion of Vincent's pick, the movie Ex Machina, about sentient robots brought to mind Asimov's robot series, a collection of short stories and novels written over Asimov's lifetime that explore precisely the issue of the role of sentient robots in human civilization. Whole collection is available at a package as a package at Amazon. I had a penetrating conversation with a geek at Best Buy yesterday. I'm really sorry. (laughs) And he assured me that my audio issues are related to a crappy router. Inspired by listening today, my plan is to cram for TWIV 371 on the red eye, returning to Florida early on January 8th, install a new router, and join you for the recording. Tight schedule, but I'll try to make it work. Thanks again, and my apologies for the length of this email. Dude. (laughs) Um, you know, the thing about nuclear capsid, Rich, you say it's not entirely black and white. It's a thing defined by people, right? It's our attempt to try and classify stuff. So it's always going to be a little fuzzy. 
I so I went to Principles of Virology Volume uh, episode <laughs> episode four. <laughs> episode four. <laughs> A new hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, edition four. This is the definition for nucleic capsid. The nucleic capsid is the nucleic acid protein assembly packaged within the virion, used when this assembly is a discrete substructure of a particle. In other words, tobacco mosaic virus is a nucleic acid protein assemble, assembly, but there's no envelope, so it's not a substructure. Therefore, we don't call it a nucleic capsid. Anyway, we can talk with Rich about this. Uh, Rich, right. Rich texted me, and he said he watched X. Ex Machina, he said it was weird. It is weird, but it's good, nevertheless. And I have read, I started reading, reading Asimov's um, Foundation series. And I started at the first book, which actually wrote after uh, many of the other ones were, were written. And it's really cool because there are a couple of robots in there, and you don't really know they're robots until pretty far in the story because they're really human. Have either of you read any of those? I have not read the Foundation series. I've read the Robot series. Yeah, the Foundation series. So they have robots in them as well, and they're very, very sentient and, and human and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. All right. So hopefully he'll get a new router and everything will be fine. Yes. Um, Kathy, can you take the next one, please? This is from Clarissa. Oh, I know. Hi, Twivers. Nice episode about Zika virus infection and microcephaly. Just a brief comment. Three arboviruses transmitted by Aedes aegypti are currently circulating in Brazil. Dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. Right. Although the last one is not a flavivirus, the symptoms are quite similar. So I guess we still have a lot to learn here. Clarissa Damaso. Who is from Brazil. Yeah, I think <clears throat> she's in uh, Rio. Yeah, that's Pretty sure right. she's in Rio. Now... I'm not sure. I, I agree. We always have a lot to learn. But what is she actually saying? That all three of these are difficult to distinguish, and who knows what's going on with the microcephaly? Uh, um, probably. Well, right. Well, the, the whole the whole situation is difficult because the symptoms overlap, and this yeah. was already the case with dengue and chikungunya. Um, yeah, now and Zika, there's, Zika I mean, for years, there's been this issue of how much dengue do you have and how much chikungunya do you have? And if you just track it by symptoms, you don't know. Okay. So now add Zika to the mix and it could be any of those three or some as yet to be named virus, um, or what have you. Right. Okay. Uh, Robin sent, uh, a very brief email, skip the cowbell, go for the cow. And he sent an audio file of a cow mooing. <laughs> yeah, it took a couple more clicks than I expected, but I did eventually hear the cow. Alan, can you take the next one? All right, Suzanne writes, uh, this is regarding Hep B vaccine. My original experience was 12 years ago, so things may have changed at least once since then. But when we were interviewing pediatricians, we were told it would be offered at the hospital, but our doctor recommended waiting until the two-month well check, since I tested negative and no one else who would be around the baby had it either. Originally, the vaccine was only given immediately to babies born to Hep B positive mothers. Once the newborns of positive mothers were regularly getting the vaccine and kids from non-positive mothers became a bigger population to catch Hep B, this info was on pro-vaccine papers I no longer have, the CDC's decision was kind of like their decision to recommend the flu vaccine to everyone because so many people fit into the categories of people it helped that they might as well. As someone wrote you a while back, in Britain, it's still, or at least several years ago, only recommended right away for at-risk newborns. So things may be different now, but at that point, doctors were still more worried about getting started vaccinating newborns who were obviously at immediate risk right away and weren't unlikely to let other babies wait a couple of months. Uh, I loved the dream about all of you as a band. That was wonderful. I often listened to podcasts at bedtime and must have drifted off because I woke up realizing I had just dreamed I was working on something while listening to that dream about <laughs> you on the podcast. It's a little meta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Inception. Uh, one last thing. I'm sorry you didn't like the Titanium Physicists podcast, Vincent, but I'm glad you mentioned it in yours because I'm really enjoying it. I don't mind wonky sound and unprofessionalism in podcasts. Sometimes it even makes it more fun for me. That's not to say I don't appreciate all the work I can tell you put into yours. Thanks for everything you all do. Well, you're quite welcome, Suzanne. I, I, I understand that you, some people don't mind bad sound, but it's not hard to get good sound. And I feel if you want people to listen, the majority are going to want nice sound. And you should make, I think it's kind of insulting to make bad sound 
you know, especially in the one episode, somebody in the background was shuffling papers and opening a drawer and slamming a door and all this stuff. I think that's not fair to your readers, you know, and I understand that you, you know, don't mind, but I think a lot of people do. And I well, personally cannot handle it to hear that. And it, and it handicaps the, the production because they're going to lose, <laughs> they're going to lose people like Vincent and probably me, um, <clears throat> Who might otherwise listen to them, but who, who can't put that's, up with the audio. Exactly. I mean, if you have good audio, everyone's going to listen, unless the content sucks. I'm sure right. that their content is good. I just can't listen to it. Uh, and by the way, this is true for video, too. I was, mm-hmm. I was wor- wor- in working with video crews, they, they always say, you know, you can, have, you can have crummy video that's flickery and has all kinds of lighting problems. And if the sound is good, people will say it's adequate. Right. But if you have any problems with the sound, it doesn't matter if you have perfect, clear images with beautiful lighting, people will hate it. So, yeah. (laughs) Okay, Jeremy Luban writes, Driving down the Mass Pike, I heard your discussion about more cowbell. Just so you don't feel so alone, as soon as you mentioned it, I started tapping my left foot. Automatic transmission. <laughs> singing, singing the old mountain classic. Dwink, 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 da, 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 Mississippi Queen. Yeah, it's great. And anyway, actually, I added it to the end of the episode, which you probably yeah, didn't. I didn't hear it. Yeah. You heard it. Probably Jeremy didn't go to the end. Well, he might have. Somebody on the website, actually. Uh, he might have, yeah. He, he, I should give him the... Um, Benefit of the doubt. At the website, someone left a note this morning, which I'll pick up right now. Okay, here we go. Um, don't worry, Vincent. I got your mountain reference. <laughs> Just as Twiv, Twim, and Twip make up my perfect trifecta of biology podcasts, Mississippi Queen, Don't Fear the Reaper, and Honky Tonk Woman make up the cowbell trifecta <laughs> of rock. <laughs> yep. Ah. That's great. I might as well read this other comment here. It's got three comments. Very good. Hello, Twiv. I am a U.S. Marine who loves listening to your podcasts. This is uh, Major D. I always learn a lot and occasionally get a chuckle from the wry humor. You discussed what a group of virologists is, and I would submit that a vector of virologists sounds good. <laughs> the weather in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina is 66F and cloudy. Semper Fi, Major D. Cool. Cool. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. a Marine. All right, back to Jeremy, and he says, as far as a term for a group of virologists, how about a swarm of virologists? In contrast to the plaque, it conveys the diversity. Mm. Uh, so some things just hit a, a nerve with, with individuals, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. That, that one did. All right, um, are we up to uh, Kathy again? I don't okay. remember, yes. I think so. Emma writes, Dear Twifsters, I wanted to say big thank you for talking about Zika virus in your last episode. I have colleagues in Brazil that are working hard to figure out how to test for Zika virus and trying to figure out if there is a direct link between Zika virus infection during pregnancy and microcephaly. The Pan American Health Organization wrote a nice summary of the epidemic so far and included a graphic showing the increase in microcephaly rates, figure one. I agree with all your conclusions that we can't show causality from these epidemiological studies, but that we need to determine whether Zika virus infection is related or if there is something else that is causing the rates of microcephaly to skyrocket. I was forwarded this article by a Brazilian colleague, which describes a small village that is dealing with the birth of many microcephalic infants. Their society will be caring for these infants with variable neurodevelopmental delays for many years to come. And there's a link there in the articles in Portuguese, and my postdoc and I worked on doing a Google Translate of it. Thank you for all you do for the scientific community. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases fellow and was introduced to TWIV about three years ago during residency by my CDC research mentor. Your banter kept me awake during long commutes on little sleep. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> Glad to hear it didn't put you to sleep. Right. There are people for whom we know that happens. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. But what is the gist of the article? Um, now I've lost that link. Oh, All right. Cities having trouble. Um, they're going to have to care for 11 cases. They've had 11 cases of microcephaly in three months. Hmm. I don't speak or read Portuguese, but I know a little Spanish, so I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. yeah I, um, Por- Portuguese is about as, as close uh, as you can be without being a dialect. <laughs> I have it. I have it back now, and um, the gist of it is that they've had this drought for four months too, and so they mentioned 
Um, there's no water anywhere except in the most diverse containers, such as buckets and pots and uh, oh. other things. The makeshift storage water from tank trucks everywhere proved to be a mistake um, because it led to proliferation of the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Oh. And that immediately triggered in my mind the whole situation with Flint, Michigan, getting their water uh, from the Flint River and not, uh, and how that led to all this lead poisoning of children. And so I just suddenly flashed on, you know, maybe this drought and the water and, and maybe that's a contributing factor to this microcephaly. Yes. Mm. So it yeah. just, that's where my brain went with this Google Translate. But interesting. Yeah. It does go on to talk about the um, the eleven cases are treated as as suspects. Uh, you're not sure if that's a good Google Translate or not, but um, anyway, um, uh, yeah, they don't. I don't really see the thing that this that the listener pointed out, which I think is a key fact that you know the society is going to have to deal with these uh, individuals for a long time to come. So yes, that's, that's a sad thing. Yeah, and if it is, I mean, if it's Zika, then you've got one set of measures you need to do. And if it's the water, then you've got a different set of measures. So there, there's going to be some overlap. You obviously don't want the mosquitoes there in any case. Yeah. But yeah. it is very important to get to the bottom of this as quickly as possible. Yeah. Alan, can you take that last one? Sure. Um, let's see. That was Emma, so we're down to Anthony. Regarding the most dangerous thing about Ebola... What scared me was the irresponsible Barnum-esque news coverage that turned victims into threats and heroic returning healthcare workers into pariahs. The bizarre turn of public policy put in place by the New Jersey and New York governors didn't happen in a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, Very good I, point. I really like that. What scared yes. me was the irresponsible Barnum-esque news coverage that turned victims into threats and heroic returning healthcare workers into pariahs. You might say we were distracted by carnival barkers and sideshows, to borrow a phrase. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep, I totally agree. And, for, and I, what the New Jersey and New York governors did, we discussed. Um, you know, they con they countered what the CDC recommendations were, yep. and um, not not correct. All right, now we have a little bit of science uh, in the form of papers. We have a snippet in a paper. The snippet is a Science Express report published on December seventeenth. And the title is a, An Orthopox Virus-Based Vaccine Reduces Virus Excretion After MERS Coronavirus Infection in Dromedary Camels. And the first author is Bart Hogmans, and the last author is Albert D.M.E. Osterhaus. This comes from the Netherlands, from the Erasmus Medical Center, where you will also find, um, <laughs> let's see, Fouché, Ron Fouché. Boy, I'm getting old. <laughs> it's from uh, another, uh, the other people are from Munich, Germany, Barcelona, and Hanover, Germany. Big collaboration, multiple authors, uh, a large consortium of people. Now, everyone uh, should be familiar with MERS coronavirus. This was a new coronavirus. Well, we discovered it in Saudi Arabia in 2012. It's been around before then. And uh, of course, coronaviruses are envelope plus stranded RNA viruses. And you might know the SARS coronavirus, of course, causes a res serious respiratory disease. And MERS coronavirus, uh, in largely in the Middle East, but cases have been exported elsewhere. After much research, it looks like camels are a reservoir for the virus. It looks like a number of individuals have been infected uh, from respiratory secretions from camels, which are very numerous in this part of the world. Although many people don't have, who get sick don't have a history of, of camel contact, so how they get it is still somewhat of a mystery. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it is uh, continuing to cause infections. And there's a very nice page at the WHO, which gives you a summary of the disease itself, preventative measures, and the number of cases. So WHO has been notified of 1,621 laboratory-confirmed cases globally, 584 deaths, and 26 countries have reported cases since uh, September 2012. So, you know, there's some concern that this will become more extensive. We don't know 
you know, if it will or not. And so they're one and of it's, the. Oh. It's probably. Um, I mean, it's it's not. It doesn't seem to be one of these cases where there was one incident where it was introduced from bats or whatever into camels and then into humans. Um, it seems like the camels are sustaining their own infection, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, there and, is a, and I guess, in fact, we're, there's the old story of the wise men crossing the desert with their camels, and they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrhs, right? That's right. Mm, very <laughs> bad. <laughs> myrrhs, excellent. That's great. But Wait. seriously, no, it, it, it seems to be an ongoing thing in the camels, okay. and it may just be that we finally detected it in people because we were looking. So a, how many humps does a dromedary camel One hump. Have? One, one hump. hump. Remember, D for dromedary, so yeah. the D on the side is one yeah. hump. What do you call a camel with three humps? Mm, I don't know that I can think of a letter that quickly for that. Pregnant. Oh. Where did I just hear that joke? <laughs> it's the only joke I've ever remembered. It's not that good, I know. Where did I hear it? Oh, well, it wasn't Dixon because he's not here. Anyway, camels are implicated. So a good way to... Um, stop the transmission to humans would be to immunize the camels. So that's called a One Health Solution, and that was done for a Hendra virus in Australia. They uh, developed a Hendra virus vaccine, which goes from bats to horses to race horses mainly to uh, the trainers of the horses. You don't want to immunize all the people, so you immunize the horses and you prevent transmission. So here, you don't want to immunize everyone against MERS probably, so if you immunize the camels, you could, in, in theory, prevent transmission to people. And there's some benefit for the owners of the camels as well, because they do actually get sick with this virus. They do get sick. Of and course, these, uh, these are camels that in many cases are being kept for racing and things like that, where you, you don't want it, you know, yeah. you don't want it down for a few days. Yeah, so they have, they use races, they have them for pets. People like camels over there. They, they eat them also, right? They right. raise them for meat. So... Uh, we this is the the idea. So there, this paper tells us some preliminary work uh, on a pox virus vectored vaccine, and um, this is a, a virus. Well, it's based on um, vaccinia virus, and it's a highly attenuated strain. It's called MVA. We have talked about it before. Modified vaccinia virus Ankara, and this has been used in many other uh, experimental scenarios and also in clinical trials in people. And so they insert the gene encoding the glycoprotein of MERS coronavirus, called the S or spike protein. Uh, and they previously tested this vaccine in mice. They inoculated mice with this virus. Again, it's a recombinant virus carrying the gene for the S glycoprotein of MERS coronavirus. Uh, it induces high levels of antibodies, that neutralize the virus, and it limits, after vaccination, it limited replication of the virus in the lower respiratory tract. You can infect mice with um, MERS coronavirus as long as you make them transgenic for the human receptor, which is dipeptidylpeptidase number four. We talked about that a, long, a while ago as well. So this is now going into camels, which is a more expensive proposition, of course, because these yes. are large and expensive animals. I must say they have photographs of these in this paper. They are yes. they are young camels. So they are smaller, of course. They're very cute actually. There's this one mm -hmm. photo. You should I don't know if people can access this, but um this um I forget whether I logged into I think I got this open access. This panel A figure yeah. figure two you did? panel Panel A. I, I think I got yeah. this open access. Yeah, so they have lower right, this camel, he's looking at the camel, he or she is looking at the camera. Mm -hmm. And he's just very inquisitive and neat, mm -hmm. looks like a neat animal, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the ones with the with, uh, runny noses are not so cute, but uh, panel well, A, the upper left, looks cute. It's a lot yeah. of snot. Yes. They really make, so these guys, when they get sick, I think these are the unvaccinated animals, they, a lot of right. stuff comes out of their noses and you can imagine aerosolizing it and stuff. Sure. But this guy, a girl on the lower right, you know, she has nice uh, eyelashes and every he or she has nice eyelashes. And oh yeah, they're cute animals. I would, I would talk to that animal. <laughs> I have never, have I ever met a camel? Probably in a zoo somewhere. <laughs> oh yeah, they, most zoos have. Uh, they're pretty easy to keep. Have you ever ridden most on a camel? Have. I have. 
I would be cool to ride on one. Just yeah. got a Christmas card from a virology colleague who rode on camel in Morocco. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you ride them, is it typically a, a dromedary or is it a Bactrian? It could be. Uh, this one was dromedary. So you sit on top of the hump or in front of it? What? How does that work? It looked like they're sitting in front of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the one I rode was dromedary as well, and I don't recall exactly how the saddle was positioned. Hmm. It was it was just like a little, you know, walk around. A, it wasn't going anyplace interesting. But <laughs> All right, so in this experiment, they inoculate camels. They t- have four camels twice a week at a four-week interval with ten, two times 10 to the eighth plaque-forming units of uh, this, um, this vector, this vaccine virus. Uh, in both nostrils, using a uh, atomizer, because the upper tract is the place where the virus mainly replicates, and then they also gave them an intramuscular injection in the neck. I guess there's strong, thick muscles up there. Because if right. you put mine, you couldn't do that to me. That's for sure. I would no. scream. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you look at the way a camel is built, they they have to have some very, very heavy duty neck muscles because yeah. their head is sticking out you know, on that sort of yeah, S-shaped. Yeah. It's got to hold it up, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, okay, so four animals twice a week with four-week interval, both in, intranasally and in the neck, and then four control animals. They got a wild-type um, modified Vaccinia Ankara without any spike gene insert. Uh, or uh, they they also did the PBS control, so two uh, vector and two PBS control. And the ones that got the vaccine developed serum neutralizing antibodies, so they can draw serum from these animals and do a, a neutralization test in in cultured cells, and no antibodies in the control animals. They used an ELISA to show that these antibodies were specific for the S protein of MERS coronavirus. So that's a an assay where you could look at binding of antibodies to the recombinant protein, which is probably immobilized on plastic. Um, and um, let's see, low levels of neutralizing antibodies detected three weeks after the boost in the nasal swabs. So they want to know if you're getting mucosal antibodies produced. Low levels, though. Um, so the others were serum neutralizing antibodies. So it's very interesting. You, in, you inoculate them IM and intranasally, you get a little bit of uh, nasal antibodies that are neutralizing and pretty good in the serum. Uh, and then they challenge them because you want to know if this immunization protects them. They give them 10 to the 7th TCID 50s tissue culture infectious dose 50%. That's the amount of virus that will infect half of your cultures. And again, they challenged them intranasally by uh, misting it into them. Um, and, and now they're so they're challenging them with MERS, MERS coronavirus. coronavirus yes, um, of course. And they're doing they're doing this in a BSL three, I assume, right? Yeah, it's a BSL three. Yeah. yeah. So you got these yeah, big animals in a BSL three. <laughs> this is this is an expensive project. Yeah, you have to do because it is a three uh, virus. Yeah, There's no vaccine. BSL3 it's virus. it's aerosol transmitted. Yeah. But this is the test you have to do to see if the vaccine works. Yep. So on challenge, uh, the animals showed mild clinical signs, relatively small rise in body temperature in the control vaccinated animals a day after challenge, some dry mucus in the nostrils of most animals after day four from day... Yes. Yeah. Does that mean they don't have dry mucus in their nostrils ordinarily? I I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, Yeah. I took that to mean that it was... It was some that wouldn't have been expected, but I was also curious about that. Yeah, okay. I mean, okay. presumably, they all got virus, right? So, yeah, right. It just, the, or yeah. they comment on the fact that they get dry mucus in, yeah. in you know, in one of the nostrils. Of right. Is that animal. unusual? Right. Yeah. <laughs> From day eight and to 10 onward, all control vaccinated animals had a runny nose, which they didn't see in the MVA spike vaccinated animals. And that's what the pictures will show you, the runny snotty noses. Camels. Snotty yep. camels. Right. right. So I thought this was funny because uh, <laughs> they, I'm just reading along and they say runny nose. And I, know, I thought, I know, I know. There, there's a medical term there's for a, that. Yes. You know? Because later, instead of talking about the soft palate, they call it the palatum mole. Yes. Oh, you yeah. Know? 
<laughs> there are a lot of technical terms. <laughs> so, in, so to just say runny nose, runny nose. Kind of, yes. Yeah. What is the term, Kathy? Uh, rhinorrhea. Right. Yeah, there's a term for everything. Runny sure. nose, right. you know, tears in your eyes and all that. And, and we don't know what causes it. That's idiopathic. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, then they want to know if there's any infectious virus in the respiratory tract. So um, I, I, they swab them, I presume. I, it's, I'm not remembering what they did, but they then they look for infectious virus. And in the control vaccinated animals, they get high titers of virus in all the animals. And in the vaccinated animals, it's substantially lower. It's log logarithms of virus lower. So from day one to about six, the control uh, infected animals have making quite a bit of virus. And uh, I'm looking here, 10 to the fifth TCID 50s and downward. Whereas the vaccinated animals are making about 10 to the one TCID 50s per mil. So it's substantially reduced, but it's not zero. And they do also PCR to look for viral RNA. And there's clearly viral RNA even in the vaccinated animals, but it's much lower. Uh, than in the control animals. So that is really, the question is, is it reduced enough to block transmission to people? I don't know. Because it, they say in, in the discussion later that they want to work on better vaccines that maybe will block virus reproduction. I don't know if they can do that. At some point, you have to just try it, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Because we don't really know how much a camel has to make to infect a person. Right. So. This we do be, we do know that it's a not a super common event. Right. It's not something that's like an acknowledged occupational hazard of camel handlers. It's it's a relatively rare thing that somebody gets this. Yeah. So it this may be enough. On the other hand, there are probably some things that they could do to tinker with it, you know, try some adjuvants, try a few other things to try and increase the the immune response or or do a prime and boost. Mhm. Mm you know, but so, I mean, you, you, I mean, you have to say if they could work on this for five more years, right? In the meantime, sure. people are getting infected. Yes. You know, do you want to get it out there and see? I, I don't know. I mean, this is an animal vaccine, so it's not. You don't have to go through the same hoops. You as don't a have human to clear vaccine. the same. You don't have to clear the same bar. So they may. It may make sense to just get it out in the field while continuing. Yeah. Other work because. But, but you have to think about the risk of preparing the inoculum. I mean the vaccine and and giving the vaccine right or no? uh well there's not in preparing the vaccine there's not much risk because you it's not oh right not it's yeah it's it's just the cha yeah you're not going to be doing challenge experiments so okay right. yeah yeah you would just problem. you would just inoculate young camels which is it seems to be that young camels get infected first right. and they make a oh, right. virus right? right so and then you do some epidemiology and see all right. right. How, are they, right. how much right. are they shedding, and are, are there any infections associated with it? It's not an easy trial, right? Because you're not you're not just looking for the camels; you're looking for people, and so. Right. But you could do it. Um, I mean, it would be it would be a lot cheaper than doing a hundred camels in a BSL three to scale up. You could sure. you could go out and just vaccinate all the young camels and look at rates of MERS in vaccinated versus unvaccinated herds, mm. um, and you know actually start distributing this vaccine and if you want to try something like a uh, prime and boost strategy you could con continue distributing it and recommend vaccinating again annually yeah, um, yeah. and see if see if the revaccinated animals do better that sort of thing and we haven't mentioned this yet but the fact that this is made in this uh, MVA vector uh, is potentially interesting to the camel owners because it apparently produces some cross-reactivity protection against the camel pox virus, yes. which is a real problem for camels. Right. right. Yeah, you can sell it as a dual benefit, right? Dual, dual vaccine. You could even tinker with the vaccine designed to improve the camel, camel pox effect, maybe. Mm -hmm. So they also, then they, uh, unfortunately, they sacrificed two animals per group because these are big animals and uh, right. too bad they had to do that. But they wanted to look at virus in various organs. Uh, so they first look at gross pathology, which uh, over on TWIP, we were told that means simply what you can see with your eye. <laughs> it's not that it's gross. <laughs> you don't have to look in a microscope. And uh, they don't see 
uh, any significant changes in any of the animals. They do they do find RNA transcripts in several organs, uh, but only infection virus only in the noses and the tracheas of the animals. And um, they do a very have a whole paragraph, a very long paragraph, which is a very detailed description of the pathology that they observe. And it's interesting because, as Kathy said, they say runny noses, but here they say, uh, for example, histopathological analyses showing multifocal moderate rhinitis with multifocal epithelial necrosis, lymphocytic and neutrophilic exocytosis. You know, they're pretty technical, but they say runny nose. Yes. Funny. <laughs> Basically, they find uh, immunopathological changes in at, under a microscope in the respiratory tract, and it seems to be uh, less substantial in the immunized animals. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but I don't, I don't think we need to. Right. That's basically it. So it, it seems to reduce uh, symptoms. It reduces virus shedding. And they say we're going to keep working on it, you know, uh, we're going to try a DNA vaccine, maybe, or a prime boost. So they do say sterilizing immunity may not be possible to achieve. Studies in the field indicate that MERS coronavirus positive, seropositive dromedaries may carry coronaviral RNA in their nasal secretion, excretion. So even if you have antibodies from a previous infection, you may still be shedding virus. But uh, that remains to be seen. I, I don't know. I would just try it in some camels. But... Um, yeah, they they also point out that this orthopox based vector uh, has previously been used um, by Osterholm and um, Bernie Moss's group uh, in a paper where they were looking at immunization against measles in some kind of primates. And um, mm. uh, does it say in the title? Yeah, macaques. Um, and and that's. Uh, nice because it can produ- produce protective immunity even in the presence of some pre-existing maternal antibodies. Right. So that might be useful. Yeah, they say that this MVA is one of the most advanced recombinant poxvirus vectors in preclinical and clinical trials for vaccines against infectious diseases and cancer. I don't know. It seems good to me. What I found is cool is that you know we first picked up this virus in 2012, and here at the end of three years later, we have a vaccine candidate. It's pretty good. I like that. You can do things quickly mm-hmm. sometimes. And it's a nice picture of camels there. Yes. Mm-hmm. What's this recipe for, Alan? Big stuffed camel. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> it appears to be it appears to be genuine, yes. Oh my gosh. How can you put a stuffed camel? It's too big. A large oven. Or you oh, or I'm sure you, it's not uh, a joke. It, there, there's some debate about that. It's been published in a couple of home economics books, and um, and the <laughs> Snopes why it's on Snopes. The Snopes link that I gave, they label it as true because it probably is based on truth. Um, it's just, that uh, you you stuff the camel with it's like turducken, you, except uh, that you stuff uh, the camel with lamb, and then you stuff the lamb with chickens, and you stuff that and, and so forth. I like the first line: skin, trim, and clean camel. Camel. Yes, once take, you get over the hump, could take you a day. Yes. Wow. How did now? How did you actually search for a camel recipe, Alan? I, I had seen this years ago, and so I, when you were talking about they had oh. to sacrifice a couple of the camels, I thought, oh yeah, there's a recipe for that. Wow. Hmm. I, I'm from a southern family, so you know the phrase "you can eat that" is pretty, uh, pretty common. <laughs> has so if anyone listening has ever eaten camel, tell. I would like to know what it's like. I know. I know they are. They are definitely. The the meat is definitely cooked and eaten. I do not know for certain if it's if it's cooked in this fashion. Yeah, right. No, no. People do eat it, and, and there are places in the Middle East where they raise them for food production, for sure. Right. Um, I wonder if it tastes like chicken. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would expect it to taste more like beef. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty cool. We'll keep our eye on that. And then our main paper is a paper published in Cell, Host, and Microbe on December 9th. It's called Neuronal Stress Pathway Mediating. A histone methyl phospho switch is required for herpes simplex virus reactivation. And I thought this would be good for the holidays because for many people, the holidays are very stressful. And and we all have herpes simplex viruses latently in us. Most of us do anyway. And many of us will develop cold sores as a consequence. 
So here is the mechanism or part of the mechanism for what, what stress is doing to reactivate your herpes virus. And also, infection. this holiday is all about giving people a bunch of junk. Uh, Ooh, and you will understand yes. in moments what Alan is referring to. So a quick primer on herpes simplex virus. We're all infected very early in our life, possibly within the first year of life from our parents probably who shed virus at some time. Um, it goes into the, there are two kinds, of course, there's a, a respiratory tract version and a genital tract version, but the respiratory tract version would, the virus would get into your mucosal surfaces, it would cause an infection. And then uh, the virus travels to peripheral ganglia where uh, the genome remains, is silenced, and the DNA remains uh, in your peripheral neurons until it gets reactivated, in which case it replicates and you get a cold sore. So in in the uh, oral version, the virus is typically in the trigeminal ganglia, which are on either side of your, your jaw, sort of below your ear or in the ear area. And these innervate your lips. So the virus is in the neurons in the trigeminal ganglia when you have a stress or some people say they go skiing and they get UV light. I don't know how that would work, but the virus replicates. Virus particles are produced. They travel down the nerve, and then they emerge on your lip as a cold sore. And there's virus present in that cold sore, and that's how you transmit it to other people who, if, if they don't have it already, including a kid, right? So the people really want to know how this happens. How this re It's called reactivation. You have a DNA. It's sitting there. The only thing that is produced from this genome is a small RNA called the LAT uh, RNA, LAT meaning latency, right? And nothing else is made. And then under some stress, which happens at the holidays, the virus starts to replicate. So this is a cool paper which uses a model of ganglia to try and understand this, all right? So... Well, and this is this is not just, I mean, it's interesting because the virus does a weird thing, but it's also interesting as a means of studying um, gene regulation, because this is a this must capitalize on some fundamental pathways involved in gene regulation in neurons in order to be able to pull off this trick. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, when the virus infects a cell, it undergoes a, a, a number of cascades of gene expression. So the virus has packaged within it a, a protein called VP16. It's actually in the virus particle. And that protein gets into the nucleus along, and the DNA, of course, also goes in the cell nucleus. And that protein is needed to allow cellular uh, transcription proteins to be able to recognize the viral promoters. And then you have immediate early mRNAs produced, and then early and then late mRNAs that encode different sets of proteins. The late mRNAs include structural proteins that you need to build a virus particle. Right? You want to make those late. You don't need those early because you're not ready to make a virus particle. Now, uh, in when you have reactivation, you have a DNA in the nucleus of a neuron that in, under some stimulus, you know, stress or something, starts to make viral mRNAs that appears not to be dependent on VP16, this virion protein, because there isn't any, right? That only comes in with the virus particle. And then you have, a, again, a series of gene expression events, and they call this phase one um, for this early, for this reactivation as opposed to lytic infection, okay? And the, and the idea is that cellular proteins are involved in this. Now, previous work has has really looked at this. Many people have have tried to understand what reactivates, obviously, because if you understand it, maybe you can prevent it in some way. Right. Um, so one of the one of the key findings is that if you inhibit a, pro, a kinase, so many of the things we're going to talk about in this paper are called protein kinases. These are enzymes that attach a phosphate group to a protein. And the one here is called phosphoinositide 3 kinase, or PI3K. If you inhibit that, it... Uh, deprives neuronal cells of nerve growth factor, which is a form of stress for those cells, and that will cause reactivation of a herpes simplex virus DNA. Okay, and phosphate attachment. I mean, just for folks who are who are new to the molecular side of this, um, that's kind of like a general purpose switch for all kinds of things in the cell. 
many protein kinases in our cell and you stick a kinase on it or you take a, you stick a pro um, a, a phosphate on something you take a phosphate off to turn it on or yeah. turn it off depending on what the context yeah, is yeah very very important for many many cellular activities so other ways that you can it's known that you can reactivate latent herpes virus genomes is by cutting a nerve so if you have a nerve ganglion culture and you cut the axon it's called axotomy you can reactivate the genome, so that obviously is transmitting some kind of a stress. Heat shock, you raise the temperature, that'll reactivate the genome. And these are all associated with activation of another protein kinase called junk, which Alan already referred to. It stands for c jun and terminal kinase. Now, c jun is part of a transcription protein and it's very important for regulating all sorts of cellular processes. Um, but it is phosphorylated on its end terminus by this kinase called junk, J-N-K. All right, so junk is going to come up a lot in this paper, probably yes. in the title of this episode. Yes, most likely. As well. So all these stimuli that reactivate also seem to activate junk. So the authors of this paper say this must be a key event. So let's take a look at that. Okay, is everybody out there in in the listener land okay so far? I know this is a little heavy for the Chris, <laughs> for the holiday season, but it's pretty cool. Now, junk. Let's talk a little bit of junk. They are there's a bigger family of protein kinases called MAP kinases. M A P, mitogen activated protein kinases. Mitogens are things that you add to cells that make them start dividing, like growth factors and protein kinases of the MAP family are involved in signaling to tell the cell to divide. Um, and so jun junks, there, there are three genes in, in mice that encode junks, junk one, two, and three. They can be activated in, in, in a variety of ways in, in many cells. Neurons turn out to have high levels of junk activity because they need this to regulate uh, homeostasis in the neuron. And a junk can do two different things. It can be involved in physiological processes or stress-related processes, depending on what other proteins the junks associate with. And this is important because we're going to look at these in this paper. Uh, one of these other proteins is called a mixed lineage kinase protein dual leucine kinase, DLK. It's an unfortunately long, long name, I'm sorry. And then there's a scaffold protein called JIP3, junk interacting protein number three. So they can allow junk to do a stress, be involved in stress responses as opposed to physiological responses, you know, cell division and so forth. Okay, so we have junks, we have DLKs, and we have JIPs. Everybody okay so far? Mm -hmm. So now the system is primary mouse neurons. They have they take the superior cervical ganglia of postnatal mice, they remove them, and they put them in culture. And then they can infect them with herpes simplex virus type 1. They have a virus where the VP16 protein, remember that, is the protein that's needed. It's in the virus particle. It's needed for early gene transcription. It's been tagged with green fluorescent protein. And so that we can follow infection very by looking at the cells. So we have these cells, these these ganglia from mice, basically new collections of neurons. You can infect them with herpes simplex. And then they treat the cells in a way to force latency. They treat the cells with interferon. They have uh, an inhibitor of, of DNA synthesis. And basically the virus goes right into latency. And they can measure that by looking at uh, GFP, and you can see it goes down to zero, and they can see only the lat RNA is produced. And the GFP is going to give them the ability to tell when the virus reactivates. Right. Now, you may remember I told you that inhibiting this PI3 kinase <clears throat> causes reactivation, right? That's a previous result. Well, in their system, they can show that the same thing causes reactivation. They have an inhibitor of PI3K. And unfortunately, in this paper, they use a number of inhibitors with really long names. <laughs> so we can just try and refer to him as the PI3 kinase inhibitor. Yeah. Right. You know, I have to In this one. I have to say I saw this new Star Wars the other night, you know. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. The Force Awakens and one of the main characters this this uh, guy 
he meets another guy, and the guy says, what's your name? And he says, yes. FN2372. Yes. And he said, well, I can't deal with that. Let's just call you Finn. Call oh, you Finn, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we could do that too, but I won't remember what we decide. So we'll call it PI3K inhibitors. Anyway, they, have, they throw in a PI3K inhibitor into their system, and it triggers reactivation. So and at least as far as that goes, um, it looks good. Yes. Could we do a, a little digression here? Because yeah, we course. keep saying they, 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 and we haven't talked about the authors. And since oh, I yeah. talked to the did first I, author. Did I not mention the authors? <laughs> no. Go ahead. Tell no. us who the authors so are the, and where they are. The first author is Anna Cliff. Then there's Jesse Arbuckle, Jody Vogel, Matthew Geden, Scott Rothbart, Corey Kuzak, Brian Straw, Tom, Thomas Christie, and Moanish Deshmukh. And most of these people are at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, one of the authors has moved to the Van Andel Research Institute in Grand Rapids. And I talked to Anna this morning, so I can interject a few things here and there. Cool. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just so excited about this. that I, forgot I know. It's, it's cool stuff. Yeah. I'm and gonna, by the way, when we, when we introduce authors, um, we, sometimes we'll just mention the first and last author, and other times we'll read the whole list. It depends on how long the list is. So... <laughs> Don't well, anybody in this take case, it. several of them came up in my conversation with Anna, so I thought it was okay. worth mentioning yes. all their names. Yes, and, and there are only nine authors, only nine authors on this, right. Right. Um, whereas the other paper had, had more, and so we, yeah. Right. So um, I'm going to go visit UNC next September. I will meet some of these huh. individuals, hopefully, and, me, and I'm going to do a TWIV. I'm gonna, actually, they want me to do two TWIVs. Mm-hmm. With because they have so many virologists, they said we sh- you should do tw- two. I said okay, fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll have more in the can that way. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Okay, so we have this wonderful culture where we can reactivate, and what they find is that if they use this inhibitor of PI three kinase, it causes activation of junk. Okay, this phos- this kinase which we've just talked about, uh, JNK, is activated when you uh, inhibit PI3K, which causes reactivation of the latent genomes. And then they have inhibitors, of course, of junk signaling, (laughs) SB60125 and AS60145. If they inhibit PI3K with one inhibitor and then they inhibit junk with one of those other two inhibitors, that blocks reactivation. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yep. Because you can reactivate with an inhibitor of PI3K, and then you can block that reactivation with an inhibitor of junk, which is supporting their idea that junk is involved in uh, reactivation, right? Mm-hmm. They can also do this. So so far, we've we've done it with um, superior cervical ganglia. So that is in the neck region, right? But uh, they also try a different kind of ganglia, dorsal root ganglia, and they put those in cultures and they do the same experiments and they see that you can also reactivate virus from those as well with the PI3K inhibitor and then block the activation with inhibitors of junk. So Mm -hmm. that looks pretty good so far. Then the next question is, of course, is this is all in cell culture. What if you infected an animal, an actual animal, a whole mouse, and then pull out the uh, latently infected neurons and do the same experiment. So they do that. They You can establish latency in, latency in mice by corneal infection. This is the model that has been developed. You do scarification of the cornea and the virus gets into the trigeminal ganglia. So then they take out the trigeminal ganglia. If you simply cut them, which is exotomy, it, it causes activation of junk and they can they can look at this by phosphorylation of of C jun, which we mentioned is the target of one target of junk. So cutting the trigeminal ganglia, which contain the herpes, uh, causes reactivation, and, and that along with that you see junk activation. And you can in, you can block that phosphorylation by an inhibitor of junk, as you might might gather. And then they can follow some later gene expression after uh, reactivation and inhibit that with junk. So junk is seems to be essential for reactivation of sympathetic and sensory neurons, both in culture, if you infect in culture, or if you infect a mouse and then pull it out. So junk is the key. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, a- another thing that they wanted to rule out was that <clears throat> these cells are not being triggered by, uh, sorry, the reactivation is not being triggered by apoptosis programmed 
neuronal cell death. Um, it, it's known that inhibition of PI3K causes apoptosis, and they just wanted to show that uh, this didn't result in neuronal death in, in their cultures. So that just simply rules out that apoptosis is part of the mechanism. They, they want to make sure it's junk and not apoptosis. And the reason that this is uh, important that they were doing it in this lab is because Moanish Deshmukh, the uh, principal, the the final author on this paper, uh, who was Anna's postdoctoral advisor, mm -hmm. that's really his area of expertise is trying to figure out what makes neurons different uh, with respect to other cells. Why are they so long lived? Um, and so he uh, knows a lot about apoptosis, and that's a, a big area of his research. And in fact, if I understood her correctly, she was the one who brought HSV to his lab. Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, was a combination of the of the two expertises there that helped produce this paper. Right. Cool. All right. Now the next step is if you activate this junk pathway, do you get transcription of this this phase one transcription of the viral RNAs so they can assay for representative what they call lytic mRNAs that would be produced as part of the uh, replication cycle and they they inhibit uh, they activate these cells and then um, look at the production of these mRNAs and then ask if inhibition of junk does anything to them and in fact if you inhibit junk in these reactivated neurons it blocks uh, production of two uh, lytic mRNAs. They're looking at two called ICP-27 and ICP-8. However, if you take virus and infect neurons, all right, where you're going to now go through the entire cascade of gene expression, if you inhibit junk, there's no effect on this lytic gene expression. So junk is, is specifically required for gene expression during reactivation, but not during lytic replication in neurons. Right. This is very so cool. The first time through the initial infection, you don't need this. And so this is a factor that's unique to reactivating the virus. Right. You don't need junk during a lytic infection. <laughs> you only need it during reactivation. Junk. Very cool. JNK. Yes. All right. Um, now let's move to these accessory proteins of junk. DLK and GYP3. All right. Um, these are known to be activated in stress responses in neurons. Remember I told you that junk associates with these two, and that makes it have stress-related function. So they're going to ask now whether DLK and GYP3 are needed for reactivation of herpes simplex virus in their cell culture system. So they can deplete these. This is really cool. I mean, this is a neat culture system. Remember, they're taking a ganglia out of mice and culturing them, and then they can knock down... Uh, the mRNAs for DLK and GYP3 by using um, siRNA. So they can knock them down, confirm that they're knocked down, and guess what? It blocks, when you knock down DLK or GYP3, either one, it blocks the induction of uh, gene expression after you turn it on by inhibiting PI3K, remember? That's how we're turning it on every time. And again, this doesn't matter during lytic infection. If you knock down either of these, it doesn't block lytic infection. It's only reactivation. So now we know that not only is junk involved, but the two proteins it associates with, J, uh, DLK and, and uh, GYP3, which make it do stress-related functions, are also needed for reactivation as well. So what's going on here? So when this, G, when this viral DNA is sitting in a cell... It's silent except for the lat RNA. It is a, an episome. It's not integrated into the host DNA, and it's silenced. It's transcriptionally silenced, and this is associated with methylation of the histone proteins. So the viral DNA gets coated with uh, histones, just like our DNA is. And this is known to be a key regulator of transcription. If you methylate uh, histones, it tightens up the DNA Mesistone is a protein, of course. It tightens up the DNA so it can't be described. And it's known that uh, in a latent can't state... Can't be transcribed. Can't be right. transcribed. And it's known that um, herpes promoters are associated with methylated uh, histones. And specifically, trimethylations at histone H3 lysine 27. Very specific <laughs> methylation, okay? 
and this is associated with silencing, and also at histone H3, lysine number 9, dye in trimethylation as well. All right, so two specific uh, places of methylation and histone H3. So they ask, are these, uh, is removal of these, these are called repressive histone modifications, uh, is removal of these needed for reactivation by their, in their system? Now, to do this, they use a cool assay. I don't know if we've talked about CHIP before, but if, if we did, I'm going to mention it again because it's really cool. CHIP, C-H-I-P, stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation. This is a cool assay where you can ask, is, um, histone, are histones associated with a, a p- particular DNA sequence that you're interested in? So the way you do it is you, you have your DNA complex with histones, and you, you shear the DNA to make, to make it smaller because it's too viscous if you don't. Then you add antibodies to the histone, for example, you immunoprecipitate, and then you can sequence the DNA that's associated with the histone protein. So chromatin right. immunoprecipitation. So you can ask, what sequence is associated with this particular histone? And they, they can do that and show, for example, that certain promoters that are active uh, on reactivation can be associated with these uh, specific histones and even more you can get and you can buy antibodies to methylated histones you can buy anti- antibodies to that trimethylated lysine 27 and use it to specifically ask are these methylation patterns present that's really cool so yeah. n- not just an antibody to the histone itself but you can make them or get them that recognize the specific methylation of the histone protein this is just so cool it's really important that the these antibodies be very specific, yeah. and so they have the advantage of uh, some collaborators who are on the paper whose uh, expertise is in making a kind of array and then looking at how uh, um, different antibodies commercially available and so forth uh, cross-react with the different histones, and if particular modifications might or might not block those. And so those authors are Scott Rothbart and Brian Stahl. And um, Scott is the one who's now at the Van Andel, and he has this really cool database, web-based tool that you can go to. And I hope, um, Vincent, that you'll put this in the uh, show notes, because it might be useful to some people. Mm, sure. um, you can you can click on various things. It's a really cool tool, and look at uh, very specific antibodies and how cross-reactive they are with the different histones. And oh, neat. As, as they point out, it was really crucial that they have this very uh, special uh, specificity of antibody that you'll talk about in a few minutes, I'm sure. So th- this is why we have so many people on this paper, because lots of different expertises are contributing to this, right? right? Mm-hmm. All right, so the question here is, uh, do you have to remove these repressive histone modifications to get induction of simplex gene transcription, right? The repressive modifications are this tri and tri-dimethylation at these two uh, residues in histone H3. Okay, so now they have a chip assay for measuring uh, the association of these specific methylations with the viral promoters. And they, they do a preliminary experiment to show that the ICP-27 and the ICP-8 promoters are associated with the trimethylated histone at lysine 27 and lysine 9. So now they can do the actual experiment. So they have a compound called GSKJ4 <laughs> that blocks histone lysine demethylases, lysine 27 demethylases. And these are given equally obscure names of UTX and JMJD3. All right. So they have a compound that blocks the an enzyme that removes histones. And these this has been shown to inhibit reactivation of the virus. So they have their assay, of course, with these cultured GFP neurons uh, with the virus in them. Um, They add an inhibitor of lysine demethylase. It blocks reactivation, but it does not inhibit the production of ICP-27 or 8-mRNA during phase one. So reactivation is measured by getting GFP, which is quite far downstream. But if you look earlier, just phase one, the induction of uh, this, these ICPs, uh, 27 and 8, the, the inhibition of the, ly- of the lysine demethylase does not interfere with that. 
Anna had said that this was one of the more striking results that she got in the process of doing this project. She was kind of working on two parallel things. One was looking at the role of junk in reactivation, Mm -hmm. and another was looking at the role of the histone demethylases. And so when she got the uh, indication that um, junk signaling was blocked, but there was no histone, no effect of the histone demethylases um, being blocked. That mm. that was really a big kind of aha moment. Yeah, it's cool. Right, yeah, right. It's so, a very... the, so the virus can, if junk activates it, the virus can get going, but it can't completely reactivate unless it also has these demethylases active right. in the cell. It can start the uh, the induction. Can start it can right. start waking up, but it can't completely reactivate right. unless it can get out of the histone. So they find in, actually, if you add this inhibitor of lysine 27 demethylases, it reduces uh, ICP-27 expression by 70% during lytic infection. So you got to get these uh, the methylase, methyls off to get the whole thing done, but not to, to get it going. So what they say is, while demethylase activity is required for gene expression during lytic replication, not required for phase one of reactivation. So that early, very early time point not need it. Um, then there's the other uh, lysine, lysine 9, where removal of methylation has also been shown previously to be needed for reactivation. And they have an inhibitor of that demethylase. And when they do, and it's, been, it's known that this blocks reactivation in, in various systems. And they show, so they use this inhibitor in their culture system, and they show, just like with the inhibitor of lysine 27 demethylase, it inhibits reactivation but doesn't prevent phase one gene expression. So, two different histone lysine demethylases, one for 27 and one for nine lysine positions, inhibit um, reactivation but not phase one. So that's consistent with each other. So both of these methylations at histone H3, either at 27 or 9, are important for the whole cycle, but not for getting going. So how does this work? What is what is going on? If you don't have to remove the histone methylations to get the phase 1 transcription, what's allowing it to, to progress? So um, <clears throat> it's known that a neighboring serine to these lysines, uh, both of them, a serine at position 10 and a serine at position 28, is known to be modified by phosphorylation. Right? It's been shown before that if you have a lysine at the next residue, I'm sorry, if you have a methylated lysine at the next residue, phosphorylating the serine can actually uh, remove the repression. And this is called a histone methyl slash phospho switch. That's in the title. Yes. <laughs> That's where that comes from. Right. This was another kind of cool moment because uh, just as uh, Vincent posed it, it was a really striking question. If the genome is chromatinized, then how can it function and how can you get this reactivation <laughs> if you're not going to uh, uh, do the... Um, Demethylation. De- demethylation, thank you. Um, and so they went and kind of proposed this or were talking to Brian Strahl and he was a really great collaborator on this part. And he said, oh, I think it sounds like a phosphomethyl switch. <laughs> you know, right. so, or methyl phospho. I'm not sure which is the order they tend to say it. But um, she was happy because that kind of uh, corroborated their, their latest hypothesis. Or, cool. and, and so then he was the one who uh, allowed them to, or helped them get these very specific antibodies that, Again, you're going to talk about it in a few minutes. You know, it just tells you the importance of having a bunch of people around you that have different expertises Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. talking to them, Mm -hmm. right? Not just sitting in your own lab and not interacting. It's really important to talk to your colleagues. And that's why it's good to have good colleagues, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So cool. All right, so they wanted to look at whether there is a phosphate attached to this serine, so they had to identify uh, an antibody that would recognize um, both the methyl group on, on the lysine and the phosphate on the neighboring serine. So they, they looked at a bunch of commercial uh, antibodies, um, and they 
they tested their uh, their specificities uh, using a histone peptide microarray platform. So basically, these are uh, I, I suppose that these are um, different peptides with different kinds of modification, which you could then take each antibody and ask, is it is it reacting the way we want it to? And so they they identified um, an antibody that was specific for H3K9 methyl, trimethylated and serine 10-phosphorylated, but not for any of the single S10 or K9 modifications. It's really cool. So both the, the methyl and the phosphate, they have an antibody that recognizes that. And then they could go in and look at the, the chromatin of their cultured neurons and ask, what do you see when you uh, turn on gene expression by inhibiting PI3K? And they find an increase in in this H3K9 M3 slash PS10. So in other words, the trimethylation and the phosphate goes up uh, on the 27 and ICP8 uh, promoters during phase one of reactivation. And they did not see this at the promoter for the LAT transcript. Um, which gets depleted of, of methyl-3 during latency. So that's, that's sort of their control. And this increase in methyl-3-phospho-S10 on the lytic promoter is blocked when junk activity is inhibited. So in other words, if you inhibit junk, you don't see this phosphorylation of S10, and that's probably what's turning on uh, the gene expression. All right? Junk signaling... You have, his, you have uh, phosphorylation of S10, and the lysine methylation, the trimethylation, still remains. Right. So that's the mechanism. So basically, if you phosphorylate the neighboring serine, you can turn on the promoter um, without getting rid of the, tr- the methylation on the histone, and that phosphorylation uh, is done by, by junk. And actually, that's their last experiment. Uh, they look at the presence of junk on lytic promoters during reactivation. And they show that when you reactivate, junk is enriched on on lytic promoters, but not on the lat. So it looks like junk is sitting down on these promoters, phosphorylating histone H3 at these residues, and that turns on, that reactivates the gene. So it's junk. It's all about junk. And so this is very cool. So under stress conditions, junk is activated, and it phosphorylates these promoter, viral promoters. It's doing other things in the cells, of course, in response to stress, but the virus has uh, emerged, or I don't want to say evolved, but the virus is able to um, take advantage of this and use this to turn on uh, the phase one gene expression. So, you know, it's you can almost view it as there's a stress situation going on, and um, I don't know if this would be bad for the virus or it's just an opportunity to make virus so you can spread to another host. But that's the mechanism. And the one thing, I, I don't know, maybe you got an answer to this, Kathy. You know, so if you get stressed, how does, how does that turn on junk? Do we know that? Um, so I asked Anna that um, by email. Um, so the loss of PI3 kinase signaling, mm-hmm. um, let's see. Okay, yeah, leads to the decrease in AKT activation, so another kinase. Right. That leads to an increase in MLK phosphorylation, and that leads to junk activation. So there's a few more steps in between the loss of the PI3 signaling, which, as we said, can be from one of these, the Li-294 inhibitor. Uh, you can uh, also get this with NGF treatment. And then she also said that uh, her advisor says that uh, in cultured neurons, junk activity is triggered very easily. If you just slam the incubator door too hard, it can happen. Uh huh. So uh, yeah, you have to be very so careful. So that's with that's culture. actually the the step I'm interested in. How does the cell detect the door slamming? Right, it's got some kind of sensor. And I want to know what that sensor is. The same yeah. thing if you are stressed because you have a paper or a grant due, right? How right. does that get translated to yeah. the molecular steps? We don't know that, obviously. Right. right. Yeah. All, yeah. all we have so far is previous kinase, previous kinase. It's turtles yeah. all the way down. It's yeah. turtles all the way down. Anyway, it's very cool. <laughs> I don't. I don't get that reference. Oh, oh all the way down. Doctor Seuss. No. Oh no. It's uh. It's older than that. Oh, it uh, is because he wrote that book with the turtles. Turtles, the turtle. Right. Right. 
and, and and someone asks, you know, what's below, and the turtle says it's turtles all the way down. No, I thought it was him. No, no, it's um, uh, apparent, uh, possibly apocryphal story. Um, oh, uh, some uh, some noted scientist uh, thinking in the Victorian age who was confronted by a um, uh, by a member of the public and the um, who apparently said. Uh, you know, I, I know all this stuff about the the Earth orbiting the Sun is is nonsense. It's all actually riding on the backs of turtles. I saw it on an old map, and then the scientist asked the perceptive question. I'm sorry, I don't recall who this was that this is ascribed to, but asked the question. Well, what are the turtles on? And uh, wow. the the person responded, "Oh, you won't get me with that. It's turtles all the way down." Okay, um, and I bet Rich is yelling at us right now as he's listening, saying, ah, I know what it is. But I uh, looked in Wikipedia, and it says the origin's uncertain. Uh, there's okay. a, a version in Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time, um, but uh, that yeah, would I've, be I've heard it as Zeus, so yeah. Right, I, no, I've heard it as, as going way back. But. Yeah, 1854, right. uh, preacher Joseph Frederick Berg addressed to Joseph Barker. Okay. Um, with Mr. Barker, too, there are tortoises all the way down. Yes. To vociferous applause. Okay. Just hadn't heard that expression. But is it correct that it is in the Yertle the Turtle as well? Uh, Might be. I don't know. I thought, uh, it, I thought it was at towards the end of the story. I'll have to look. Uh, yeah. Certainly a lot that. of references to it in Terry Pratchett's work, but that's a, that's a whole different story. I'm not seeing it in, in the Wikipedia. Um, back when you were talking about um, this, it reminded me of part of the conversation with Anna. Um, uh, you know, does the virus somehow sense when a neuron is in trouble um, and think, okay, now do I have to get out? And I told her that Vincent would be upset at that <laughs> <laughs> yes. attribution of thought to the yeah. virus. And she said, well, you know, herpes is pretty good at sensing a lot of things. So, uh, Well, it is a matter of sensing, right? And that you can imagine that there's a negative um, situation associated with stress in a neuron. So, for example, if the neuron is going to die, mm -hmm. the virus needs to replicate and get out. Right. So that could have been an original selection for that. So you can you can word it in a way that it doesn't involve right you know, right right thinking about doing that because <laughs> which even, is better. They even point out in this paper that this uh, having a phase one and phase two you know stepwise process where you can you can reactivate but not completely until this second hurdle is cleared where your histones are are demethyl demethylated mm. that might help the help the virus you know get re repressed as they put it if it if it's not quite the right time yeah, to exactly. reactivate, exactly. you know, the cell's not under enough stress. Yep. So it has, sets a higher bar. So, uh, Kathy, um, Anna is a postdoc, is that correct? Yeah, so let me give you a little of her background. She's a graduate student at uh, University of Edinburgh with Tony Nash and Bernadette Dutia, and she worked on MHV68 non-coding RNAs. So that's another herpes virus. And then she moved to Boston and worked in David Knipe's lab for five years, uh, where she was uh, at first working on herpes non-coding RNAs, and particularly also looking at latency in LATs and heterochromatin and in lytic infection. And she had a really great time there. Uh, she had a lot of freedom, but she was a little, she felt a little uh, stymied or whatever because all of the latency studies there was in uh, mouse models. And so she wanted to move to the model where she could do things in vitro. And so that's when she moved to Moanish Deshmukh's lab. And as I said, his interest is really on what makes neurons different with respect to other cells. So um, about, uh, so, and he had been a postdoc in a lab, uh, Gene Johnson's lab at Wash U, where they had uh, worked on this technique of the, uh, synthetic uh, su superior sympathetic ganglia in rats, uh, and then this had gotten translated to mice. And I think this is where uh, work of Ian Moore, Angus Wilson, and Moses Chow came in. These three labs um, had been looking at reactivation of HSV and the PI3 kinase pathway. So they kind of resurrected this model system it wasn't clear to me whether they resurrected it in rat or mouse, but then she definitely, as you can tell from this paper, was doing the work in mice. Um, and 
so then, um, what else was I going to say about this? Oh, I mentioned that, you know, she had these great collaborators uh, for the histones and the antibodies and so forth. And then also she mentioned uh, Thomas Christie, who had this in vitro, rea- in vivo, excuse me, reactivation uh, assay. So uh, that was a helpful collaboration. They could test the uh, junk inhibition in his system as well. And so she has now completed uh, or is being uh, it's in the works to promote her to a different title of research associate or assistant research assistant professor or something. Oh, good. But she's yeah, she's looking <laughs> for faculty positions in the United States and writing grants. Um, she's passed the eligibility for a K-99, but um, she and her uh, uh, mentor there, uh, Deshmukh, are thinking about R-21 and R-01 and so forth. Um, but, uh, she's also, as I said, on the job market. So, and she had, uh, she wrote to me that she has, uh, another aspect, not just, um, this, that, um, she's proposing to work on in the future too. Now I can't pull up that email, but, um, uh, did I have anything else? Uh, oh yeah. She said that, um, uh, her hypothesis leading from, from some of this is that, any kind of small insult or pruning event to the axon could trigger this pathway and cause reactivation. In the majority of cases, the trigger for reactivation is really unknown, and this may help to get at trying to understand how reactivation occurs when the trigger is unknown. So that's her interest. So this, of course, is all done in mouse neurons, so we don't know if the same thing happens in people, but you can now make human neurons... In vitro, you can differentiate them from precursors quite readily. You can make stem cells, then you can differentiate them to neurons. So it seems to me that you could look at this and ask if this the same junk um, phospho uh, turn on is involved, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Which would be cool. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, that's cool. Great paper, nice stuff, and um, yeah. a little complicated, was, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, two other things I wanted to mention that she did say that it was really key that there was this work of uh, Wilson Moore and the third one I n- just named a minute ago from NYU. That was a really uh, important springboard for her studies. Mm-hmm. She mentioned that it's 65 degrees and very rainy today <laughs> <laughs> in uh, Chapel Hill. And rats, there was one more thing I was going to say. Ooh. Uh, maybe it'll come to me. Um, oh, um, oh yeah. It, it was the fact that uh, when I got to uh, one line in the um, discussion where they say targeting histone demethylase activity along with the junk pathway would be an effective multi-step approach to prevent HSV reactivation. And I thought, hmm, there was no hyper press release from UNC about that. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> but in fact, there was uh, some press that uh, the... Uh, health system there did put out, um, which I gave you guys links to. Um, And she said that cell host and microbe kind of features one story pretty heavily with press and her editor was pushing for them to do two from the issue that this was in, but the other one was Ebola and that won out. So I don't know, Vincent, if you've looked at this particular whole issue of cell host and microbe, but evidently there's a Ebola paper with press mm. <laughs> so so i thought that was an interesting twist that mm. um that yeah because we kind of laughed about the fact that it didn't get the uh hyper press that uh ralph barrick's paper did right right yeah people don't care about herpes i guess right in the real world everybody's got it i don't know i don't know if an inhibitor of junk would be good though i'm, I'm sure it would have other effects right and under what? what under what conditions would you want? I mean, how can you know when you're going to get reactivated unless you're in a yeah. unless you're going to have surgery and you're going to be immunosuppressed? And if it's a problem in that situation, then I could understand. But uh, you know, just us writing grants. All right, we're going to th- we're going to take a junk inhibitor while we write this next grant. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think you should just throw out all your junk. And I and I don't know that you know getting a cold sore is not a problem. Of course. In the rare people, when it goes into your brain and causes encephalitis, that's a problem. So sometimes the virus goes the other way instead of towards your lip. And those are in, usually in people with innate immune defects, and we've talked about those on TWIV before. 
And there are not a lot of those, but um, maybe in those individuals with a known defect, you want to prevent reactivation and a drug might be useful. So I could see that. All right. Thank you for contacting her, Kathy. That's cool. Yeah. One last oh. thing she yep. said, it was helpful to be in this second lab because it was uh, very interactive and they all had all kinds of expertise in neurons and stuff. So all kinds of exposure and cross-feeding was, yeah. was really helpful. Cool. All right. We, let's do, uh, we have not many emails, so let's do them. Um, and I'll take these first couple from Anthony. I collected a bunch that he has sent recently. The first is a lovely article by our friend John Skylar, who was on TWIV not too long ago. It's called We Are All Martin Shkreli. And everyone knows Martin Shkreli, who bought yes. a, a company making a toxoplasmosis drug and jacked up the price hugely. And he was arrested last week on uh, securities fraud, which have nothing to do with his drug. But um, the article is basically talking about why do we have a system that allows this to happen uh, when Western companies in particular make lots and lots of money over drugs uh, that um, could be better used in countries where they're not afforded and how can we change this? And I mean, these are, these are issues that um, I've thought about for years. How do we get drugs to people who need them when we have companies built on the for-profit capitalism model of you know being traded on, a, on an exchange and so forth that values, profits, and so forth. But it's really nicely written, so I would suggest that uh, everyone go and read it. Did you guys l look at this at all? Yes. I did. Mm -hmm. it's lovely, I agree. isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when the whole Shkreli thing first erupted, I mean, I commented on Twitter that what he did is no different from what the pharma industry has done for years. That's right. He just did it harder than most people. You know, and, and so, yeah, um, he he bought a monopoly on this drug and, and jacked the price up. And yes, that's how a monopoly works, and that's how capitalism works, and that's why you need regulations. So, right, right. you know, not that we should necessarily go to a pure government-run system, which has got its own problems, but you need some kind of a balance there, and you can't just, you can't just say, oh, the market will fix it, because this is what the market will do. Right. All right, and then another um, article that Anthony links to is in the Chronicle of Higher Education called What Open Access Publishing Actually Costs. Interesting article uh, exploring the cost of you know publishing journal articles and how much salaries are for so forth. And uh, it's worth looking at because we talk about this all the time. And how open access is a great model, but you have to figure out how to pay for your costs. And you can minimize your costs, but there are always going to be some, right? And many journals charge the authors to do this. And I like this. There's a quote here by um, Michael Eisen, who is one of the co-founders of PLOS, Public Library of Science. And he says, PLOS has margins on our journals. The difference is we don't return money to stockholders. So many of the journal right. companies, of course, are publicly traded and, you know, if they do well, their stock goes up and so forth. So another good article. Yes. And finally, the last one from Anthony is a link to Ace Johnson singing his Influenza Blues for 1929, recorded by John and Ruby Lomax in 1939. And uh, in the winter of 28-29, a serious influenza strain hit the U.S., rising concerns that it might become a pandemic as it happened in 1918. The song expresses beliefs that were still common at the time that disease was a divine punishment brought about by sin, but medicine was working to raise awareness of the true causes of disease and of treatments and preventions. And I note that in 1928-29, we had not yet isolated influenza virus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't happen until 1930s. Right. So we were working in a blind. Thank you, Anthony, for all of that. Yeah, I went and listened to it. It's kind of a little bit scratchy, thinking about sound <laughs> quality, but still uh, interesting and worth listening to. All right, Kathy, can you take Justin's? Well, Justin no writes, just for a laugh, and he sends a link uh, basically uh, about an article saying that in the scientific method, there should be uh, a funding step added. This is from The Onion. And <laughs> my comment is this whole thing would be funnier if it didn't ring so true. Yes. <laughs> Get money. Yeah. So, you you know, you make an observation and you make a hypothesis. And then the next thing you have to do is get money. So. It's always true, right? Yeah. 
but just but harder it's, now it's than harder ever. Harder and yeah, and formalizing it as yeah. you know as a step in the scientific method, I think is yeah. Alan, uh, this uh, let's see. So Bill writes, this site contains a plethora of links and details about this ongoing battle. And I, thought, this is, I thought you might understand this. <laughs> yes. I Actually, I hadn't had a chance to read this one yet, but um, it's about content mining. Mm-hmm. and um, Sc- Scraping versus an API. Scraping versus an API. So an API is an application programming interface, um, and that is the way um, publishers will open, some, open up... Um, a way to get at the data on a site. So if you want to, um, if you want to catalog all the data on somebody else's site, or you want to develop some application that that does something with Twitter or what have you, um, you would use the API for that publisher, um, and your application would make specific calls to that interface. It's it's a machine usable interface as opposed to a human usable interface. Um, the alternative to that is something called screen scraping, which is uh, to use a program that acts just like a reader using a web browser. So it accesses the site just like somebody is going to that page and downloading the whole page, and then it scrapes whatever you're searching for off that page. If that makes sense. Um, and so this is a discussion about about why publishers prefer and insist on trying to block uh, screen scraping, and they insist on you know you, if you want to do anything besides read our site, if you want to access it with a program, you have to use the API. The API gives the publisher a lot more control over what you can and can't do with the content, mm-hmm. and this is a big struggle going on right now. Um, so the um, they talk about Elsevier, but all the big publishers are are grappling with this problem right now. Hmm. Um, I didn't realize this was an issue. Yeah, I mean, publishing publishing has a lot of issues right now. Yes, apparently. Um, and this is definitely one of them that's kind of going on behind the scenes. So the last paragraph says. APIs are being touted by Elsevier and other publishers as the obvious friendly answer to mining in their present form and with present terms and conditions. They are completely unacceptable and very dangerous. They should be absolutely rejected. Ask your library to cancel all clauses and contracts which forbid mining by stra- scraping. They have the legal right to do so. Right. Right. Interesting. And the specific thing was that this, or, or part of this is about is this statistician was doing this and he has now been forbidden to do this by Elsevier. Right. So my question would be, does PLOS allow scraping? Or do they have an API? Because this, this, this one deals with Elsevier. Yes. Um, and I don't know the answer. I would assume PLOS would allow screen scraping. It would be consistent with, yeah, uh, right. with their ethos. Uh, or if they have an API, I would, I would certainly hope that the terms of it and the accessibility of it are are much more open than yeah. Elsevier's. All right. Uh, a couple more. David writes, Hello, Twivers. I am David Kingsley Oyahu, oh, Oye, Ojiagu from, Ni- I'm sorry, from Nigeria. O-J-I-A-G-U. O- Ojiagu? Ojiagu from Nigeria. I have been a longtime listener of Twiv, but this makes me a first-time writer. I can't recall if you've had a writer from Nigeria. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But you have a great fan in me from down here. I teach virology to undergrads in a government-owned university in Nigeria, and it's amazing to hear the depth of research and knowledge which we can only dream and romanticize about here. I sincerely wish, at least for the younger ones, that research and education are largely bolstered in Africa for a more global impact experience. On a lighter note, we don't give the level of attention to weather the way, like the way I hear you do for each TWIV episode. Well, I guess we are all concerned about putting bread on the table than changes in weather pattern. Now you make me feel bad, David. Yeah. Well, maybe his weather is more the same all the time. Could be. It's been fascinating listening to you every week, and I have recommended TWIV to my students as a learning tool in virology. Awesome job, folks. Cheers, everyone. I don't know if we've heard from Nigeria before. I don't, we've certainly heard from other African countries, but I don't know. I don't, I don't either. 
You would just have to search your yeah, I could. inbox right. for that. <laughs> yes, why don't I do that while you take the next one, <laughs> Kathy? Okay. Damien writes, Good day, esteemed panel. In Melbourne, Australia, it is currently a sunny 21.6C, dew point 8.5C. Relative humidity, 43%, feels like 21.6C. And I'll remind everybody that that means it's probably around uh, 61 or 62 Fahrenheit. Yep. Wind south-southwest at 15 kilometers per hour and pressure of 10.12 point, uh, 10.12.4 HPA with zero millimeters of rain since 9 a.m. Forecast high of 24C. I will get quickly to the point for fear of making you do too many more all email shows. See the link below for an article published today in The Age discussing a chickenpox outbreak at a school in Melbourne that welcomes students who are not immunized. The article does point out that no school can refuse a student who is not immunized. It is unfortunate, though, that this school takes a soft line on immunization. And he gives the link. I could hope that this case would make a difference, but as Alan and others have pointed out on many occasions, facts can be twisted by the anti-vaccination advocates. Vincent, thank you for the recent episode with the four PhD students from Australia. It was fantastic to hear their stories and see that they are so positive about their future prospects. I finished my PhD at the Australian National University, submitting in November 2000. Given the job prospects and personal decisions, both my wife and I decided to leave academia after completing our PhDs, and we moved into industry. Best wishes from Four Seasons a Day, Melbourne. <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> Damien. So I guess the weather changes a lot during one day there in Melbourne. Hmm. Is that was that your experience? No, not at all. Oh, <laughs> I mean it was pretty much the same old day. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but I was only there for five days, you know. So maybe it's not yeah. a good sample. All right, so I searched my TWIV archive for Nigeria, and I found a letter on November, uh, September twenty third, twenty eleven, from Falei Temitope from Nigeria. And we read it. So we've heard from Nigeria before. Yes, we have from one other person. <laughs> we've heard from Nigeria. Sorry, Kat. So right. So back to Damien's email. Um, I've clicked now on this link. Eighty children uh, got chickenpox at this primary school. Mm -hmm. Eighty out of three hundred twenty. Wow. Yeah. And the dateline on this is yeah December tenth, twenty fifteen. Are we that current on our email? Yeah. Wow. We're, we're, wow. We are. Um, Nobody's interested in TWIV anymore. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we have a lot of other emails, but um, many of them are contest responses, which I thought we would delay to another time. Sure. A lot of them are suggestions. Um, you know, th yeah, so we're almost caught up. Did, did we announce the winner of the Twitter contest? Yeah, yes. We, we did we last week. Okay. No, we chose one. In the we, chose, we chose the one. Limerick, yeah. And we, and we announced it on the show. We did, um, and it was Miss Columbia. No, <laughs> we announced it. You know, I said I announced it on the show, and I haven't announced it on Twitter. I'm waiting to see how long uh, the winner will pick it up. <laughs> it I'm just curious. Spot. I'm just curious if it maybe that person will never listen again. Who knows? <laughs> In which case, we don't have to give it to the first person. We'll give it to the second right. person. All right. So you read that, Kathy. So that brings is is it your turn now? Oh, Alan? I'll take it. Yes, yeah, Silas. Silas. Silas writes, Hello, Professor Reck and Yellow and Twiv crew. While writing a paper on poliovirus, I encountered your work on poliovirus invasion of motor neurons. Unless I'm badly misunderstanding, it seems likely the virus enters the cell at the neuromuscular junction and is trafficked up the neuron to the cell body for replication, protein synthesis, etc. It seems like the poliovirus receptor, thanks for that one, Vincent, is expressed in most of the central nervous system. If this is the case, why does the invasion end at motor neurons? Why doesn't it continue to invade neurons synapsing or infected um, uh, synapsing on infected motor neurons? Thank you for your excellent work on this system and any clarity you can provide. Well, first, uh, you're right. It probably gets in through the neuromuscular junction, gets up the axon to the cell body. Only neurons in the brain and spinal cord have polio receptor on them, so that would limit the infection to neurons. But you're right, only motor neurons seem to be infected, not sensory neurons. Um, in mice, in transgenic mice that produce the polio receptor, we can get any neuron infected depending on where we inoculate the virus. Right. So they're all susceptible and permissive. So 
the restriction in, in a natural infection must have something to do by with the way the virus is brought in, and it maybe doesn't spread very well uh, to sensory neurons. So I don't know the answer, Silas, but um, all those neurons can be infected if you put the virus in, uh, next to them. But for some reason, in a natural infection, it doesn't occur. Now, other people think that in addition to this um, axonal trafficking, virus can also enter through capillaries and get into the, the brain, their spinal cord that way, which is probably another mechanism of invasion. And in that case, you know, again, the virus should be able to infect sensory neurons, but it doesn't seem to. And I don't, it's a mystery. I don't know that we'll ever know the, uh, the answer to that. It's a good question. I guess you need to um, get some neuronal stem cells, differentiate them into sensory and motor neurons. Yeah, and, we could do that, yeah. In fact, we're, we're doing that now for Entero 68. Um, so we could, and we're going to use polio as a control, so maybe we'll do that. Sure. And uh, don't thank me. That receptor has been around for many, many years. I didn't put it there. <laughs> All right, the last one is from Igor. In last week's podcast, you described the difference between capsid and nuclear capsid as nuclear capsid being part of virion structure covered by membrane or additional envelope. However, HIV has both capsid and nuclear capsid both inside the membrane. I always thought the difference was the nuclear capsid is the protein that binds nucleic acid. Right. I thought I said that. And in fact, my <laughs> definition earlier today, it is the nucleic acid protein complex, right, which is inside of something else. Right? Yes. Okay. Are you there, Kathy? Kathy left. Oh, uh -oh. no. Sorry, I was oh. muted. Sorry. The first time that you uh, gave the definition, I don't think you mentioned the specific binding to okay. nucleic acid. And I have to say that the student who challenged me on my definition of a, a nucleoprotein and nucleocapsid and capsid in class was somebody who works on HIV. So it I remember now that the confusion was also the concept of nucleoprotein versus nucleocapsid. Yeah. So, in, so in HIV, the genome, the RNA genome, is complex with protein, which is inside a capsid, which is inside a membrane. So the nucleoprotein, the, the viral RNA protein complex, that's the nucleocapsid. Right. All right, let's do some picks. Alan. I have, uh, if you haven't already seen this... Um, this is the video showing the landing of SpaceX's Falcon 9. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> this is really, mm -hmm. really cool. It's, you know, there are those old science fiction movies where the rocket takes off vertically and then you see it landing on the alien planet and it yeah. just comes down and sets down. Of course, everybody knows that's totally impossible yep. because the rocket is balancing on its thrust at the base and it's just going to tip over. It's like trying to balance a telephone pole on your car roof and drive down the road. It's... <laughs> totally insane, never going to happen. Um, so SpaceX is this private company um, that's trying to make it economically feasible to send things into space. And one of the big costs of doing that is the disposable rockets that people have been using ever since we started sending things into space. And so they came up with this idea, well, let's have the rocket go up deliver stuff into space and then come back down through the atmosphere and land on its tail just like in all the old movies. And they did it. And this, it, it totally works, and they get the thing hovering down and balancing itself perfectly, and it sets down on the pad, and you can hear in the background. Uh, there may be some PG-13 language in there. I'm not sure. But <laughs> they're, they're just incredibly excited about this, as well they should be, because it's an astonishing engineering accomplishment. So what was the key to getting this to work, do you know? Uh, lots of work. <laughs> do they have to have do they have lateral thrusters keeping it vertical for example? Uh, yeah, they have they have a way they have they're vectoring the thrust so that they they keep the thing vertical so it's like um you know continuing the telephone pole analogy it's like you're moving the uh platform around on the roof of the car constantly to keep the telephone pole balanced mm. um and then the extensive automation of the controls so that it's it's balancing itself on its tail as it comes down. And then, of course, you have to let the thrust down a little bit at a time so it mm -hmm. comes down gently enough. Um, and, of course, in the, you have to have enough fuel left so you can do this. You have to have enough fuel left so you can yeah. do this so you don't, uh, you know, run out and then come crashing down. Yeah. I, I heard an analogy on NPR yesterday. It was something like, uh, launching a pencil over the Empire State Building, having it come down on the other side in a shoebox. But yes. they didn't even mention about having it come down upright. Upright so, yeah. in a shoebox, yes. 
Yeah, this was my pick on on Twivo yesterday. Oh, okay. It was very cool. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, Kathy, what do you have? I picked the Google Ngram viewer. I don't <laughs> think we've had this before, um, but on another podcast I listen to, they they use it a lot. And so, Ngrams are uh, terms that are a continuous sequence of n items. So a unigram is a, a n-gram of one, t- so, uh, two is a bigram, and so forth. And you can search for a word or a, or a set of words. And this originally just searched the uh, Google Books corpus, and now there's a lot more things added in. And I notice that pretty much every time you start a search, it reverts back to ending at 2008. But you can put in later years, but I'm not sure it changes the results. But I found it fun to look at uh, a variety of things like, um, well, the, the example they have is Frankenstein, Albert Einstein, and Sherlock Holmes. But um, uh, I liked seeing that Spanish flu pretty much started in uh, 1918 and then uh, it you know, really took off being used uh, in the late 1990s or so and so on. The word podcast, of course, doesn't appear until after 2000. Honest Abe appears just before 1860. Um, and it has a, a couple of peaks, one in 1920, one in 1940. Um, I also did uh, all at the same time phone and telephone and iPhone. Mm-hmm. And um, telephone is really declining as phone has increased in the corpus. And then iPhone is just a tiny little blip. But and, uh, uh, Relative to what, something we were discussing earlier on the show, I just, just graphed yurtle versus turtles all the way down. and. Uh, <laughs> Yurtle okay. spikes way, way up. I mean, part of it is the scale of the graph because Yurtle obviously has a much bigger cultural footprint. Um, but it spikes before Turtles All the Way Down does. Mm. Ah, okay. Turtles All the Way Down spiked in 2000 and is on the decline. Hmm. I did Virus, which um, <laughs> had a low level of activity until 1930-something, and then it shoots up. But interestingly, after 2000, it goes down. So what does that mean? Hmm. This is, this is a book search, basically, right? Well, it, uh, according to Wikipedia, it searches more than that. Yeah. Um, uh, sources printed in American English, British English, French, German, Spanish, Russian, Hebrew, and Chinese. I see. Italian words are counted by their use in other languages. Um, uh, yeah, well, I, I only clipped part of the... Uh, Wikipedia article about it. I th- I thought it is enlarged over just Google Books. Yeah. Okay. It is very cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A v- viral follows the same. Yeah. Interestingly, it it doesn't go up particularly with the internet age. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know about this. This is neat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Okay. My I have two picks. Um, first is a kind of editorial that. I wrote with Erica Shugart from the ASM. It's called Scientists Engage the Public. just came out in MBio today, and it's a short article on on why scientists should communicate about their science with the public, like we do here on TWIV. So check it out, and um, I think I will read one sentence. Some scientists may be concerned about a social stigma or Sagan effect (laughs) associated with participating in public communication. And basically we say in this article— that it's not true. It can help you. And some studies have been done which show that communicating is better. So check that out. And then uh, the other is something I discovered on Twitter. I saw that someone had built a Phage T4 out of Lego pieces. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know where this came from. And it turns out that New Scientist ran a Lego competition. And my pick is the article describing uh, the winners. It was a December competition, and the Phage D4 is one of those uh, yeah. winners. It's just beautiful. It is really cool. Isn't it nice? Yeah. And it made from parts because you can't buy a Phage T4, but uh, these are all things that people just thought up. Mm-hmm. Um, so the I wind, love the, this last one by the nine-year-old. Oh, yes, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> it's the uh, the famous experiment, the, the Magdeburg Hemisphere is showing how powerful a vacuum is by having two horses try and pull apart the two yep. hemispheres. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. So check that out. And we have some uh, listener picks. Dennis writes, hi, Doc and all. Here's a pick. A popular YouTube photographer with almost 2 million subscribers describes 
in this one, How Eight Diseases Helped Conquer America, and gives a link to that. A picture uh, of his slide of eight diseases is included below. For audio listeners, this slide lists smallpox, typhus, influenza, mumps, tuberculosis, cholera, measles, and the Black Death. Makes me wonder whether scarlet fever or others might have been new to the Americas, too. It's a cool video. Check it out. Santa Cruz turned chilly again in the 30s at night. Happy Thanksgiving, Dennis. Now we're a month late. Not too bad. No. (laughs) And Mark writes, hello, Twiv team. I hope you are all well. Here in Austin, it has finally cooled off to a comfortable 47F. Although this feels brisk after the 70F weather we had over Thanksgiving. Talking of the weather, here is a weather website pick that I'm sure someone must have suggested before. Weatherspark.com seems to use the concept of data-rich visualization that has been promoted by Edward Tooft. I find the overarching data appealing to the eye, and I like that I can drill down to a single point if I want to. I don't know. if the, Has this been picked? Does anyone know? No. I don't I don't no, no. ring a bell. It's a very data rich site. Very it requires cool. flash. Very cool. Yeah, a lot of things are missing Same. here, unfortunately. Now, also, I have a review article to share. I came across this article when I was a postdoc, but I feel it summarizes many of the issues surrounding quasi species that came up on an episode I recently listened to. Sorry, I don't remember which one. It was probably at the one we did in Michigan, Kathy, where I talked with uh, um, Adam about quasi species. Right. Mm-hmm. Plus open access so everyone could see the great figures. Oh, plus it's open access so everyone can see the great figures. I couldn't resist the pun. <laughs> uh, I got yes. <laughs> I'm a little slow here. Uh, this is an article, Quasi Species Theory and Behavior of RNA Viruses. It's by Adam Loring, and he wrote it while a postdoc with Raul Andino. Yes, I've read this article. It's great. Mm-hmm. And I think Adam doesn't like saying quasi species anymore. And, no, in uh, fact, I just asked him about it because I was picking pages from the fourth edition textbook to list in my lecture, and it mm. included a section from the book called Quasi Species. And he said, "Yeah, just just avoid it altogether. You just don't have to say it." Yeah, that's so. fine. But now it's in the book for another five years. You know, right, right, right. <laughs> Keep up the amazing podcast, Mark. All right, that will do it for Twiv three six nine. We have one more this year. You can find this and all the others at iTunes and at twiv.tv. You should also get used to going to microbe.tv slash twiv because soon we will switch over to that, which is where all the other podcasts are living. And uh, do send us your questions and comments. And right now you could use twiv at twiv.tv. You can always use twiv at twiv.tv, and you can always go to twiv.tv, but at one point it will redirect you. Uh, So... It will be transparent to you, so no big deal. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Do you like contacting uh, authors? When I have time, yep. I do. And, I, you know, I was just lucky <laughs> enough that she was able to, you know, get back to me. I think she was probably leaving for the holiday because yeah. we, we we picked a specific time. And then later she said, I hope this makes sense. I'm writing from the car on my phone. And I wrote back and said, I hope you're not driving. Drive safely. <laughs> <laughs> nice. She wasn't driving. But, yeah, it it is fun. You get more more background that way. Yep. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. It's always a pleasure. Are you traveling for the holidays? A little bit. I'll be going down to the in-laws and in, uh, in Dobbs Ferry. And then your wife will say, let's go. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Are you going anywhere, Kathy? Nope, staying right here. Excellent. I'm not going anywhere either. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.